Uh, we are here to have a conversation about the role that faith can play in eradicating hate. And uh, I think we'll just be very casual about it and engage in conversation uh, with all of us together here on the stage, in the room. And I'm not quite sure how the people out there in the world um, can engage with us, but we're glad that you're there to watch. I'm Rabbi Ron Simons. I am the uh, founding director of the Center for Loving Kindness and Civic Engagement at the JCC, the Jewish Community Center, here in Pittsburgh, where uh, we amplify the long-held values of love your neighbor as yourself and do not stand idle while your neighbor bleeds, while redefining the word neighbor from a geographic term to a moral concept. And I'm sure that in, in the course of our conversation, I'll explain a little bit more about our work but why don't we let everyone introduce themselves in a similar way. Sure. Abdullah. Good afternoon, everyone. Assalamu alaikum. My name is Imam Abdullah Antepli. I'm a professor of religion, Islamic studies, and public policy at Duke University. And therefore, they call me the Blue Devil Imam. Uh, the mascot of my university is the Blue Devil. And if you know anything about Islamic theology, we don't do devil business, except when it comes to basketball, college basketball. So. I've been there for about 15 years. I'm happy to find out that we have more than one blue devil on the panel. Uh, and looking forward to engaging this rich conversation. My name is Bill Lamar. I'm the pastor of Metropolitan African Methodist Episcopal Church in Washington, DC, and do a lot of other interesting things. But what brings me here is that the Proud Boys, uh, a couple of years ago, uh, desecrated uh, our facility, desecrated our, our worship space. So. And I'm sure we'll learn more about that in the course of the conversation. Are we okay going by first names? Yeah. Oh, yes, please. Yes, Wonderful. I'm the only one that didn't introduce with a title, so I'm, I'm cool with that. <laughs> Thank you, Pastor. Yeah. <laughs> so um, we thought we have a, a series of questions. We'll, we'll just put them out there uh, one by one, and we'll see where the conversation goes. And again, don't hesitate. If you want to uh, engage as if we we're at Bible study, a Quran study, a Torah study, let's, uh, let's be in the conversation together. So the first one is, from a theological basis, why should people of faith care about eradicating hate? Bill, you want to start? Sure. I think for my tradition, and you know, Christianity, as you all probably know, is, has polarities. You have people who call themselves Christian and do a whole lot of things. But I function within the black prophetic tradition. And within the black prophetic strain of Christianity, the, the elimination of hate, um, the understanding that all human beings carry the imago dei, the image and likeness of God, that we are to be loved bodily and we are to be loved as our spiritual essence. So one of the challenges I have with white evangelical theology is they lift up the saving of souls, but don't have a robust theology of the body. So the black prophetic tradition sees the body as holy as well as the spirit and wants the entire human condition to thrive and live in abundance and to be free. And in order to facilitate that, the elimination of hatred is necessary. And the great forebears of our tradition worked hard to the end of eliminating hatred and understanding the connection of human beings um, across all of the divides that cause us uh, difficulty in these days. So I'll stop there. Thank you, beautiful. And there are endless reasons, um, but I will only mention three of them. I love the di distinct features, uniqueness, and differences of religions more than what we share in common. They are all wonderful, but ultimately what makes us who we are is our differences. And once we learn our differences, that's where uh, the real magic happens as far as these cross-faith conversations are concerned. It's, it's really beautiful how every religion articulates the golden rule differently, but at the essence, they all say uh, pretty much the same universal messages. This whole religion, the golden rule is just love people, treat people the way you want to be treated in, in such a unique and different way. So hate fundamental fundamentally disables, disempowers, and destroys that fulfillment of the soul of any religion in fulfilling that golden rule. Hate, hate uh, suffocates uh, the, the central quality of religion to flourish in any form and in any, form and, uh, in, in, in any strategy. 
But secondly also, being selfish, self-survival is a value. Because if I learn anything about the Islamic theology, hate is a primary threat to the one who holds the hate before it becomes a threat to uh, other people, before it becomes a source of violence to other people. So for those of us who are people of faith, who are concerned about the soul of our religion, the, the amount of unchallenged, unchecked, unfiltered hate within our theology, within our communities, is a primary threat that will erode us, our values from within. So not only it's a moral imperative, but also selfishly we should be fighting in every possible way to eradicate and filter out and weed out all forms of hate in our tradition because it's going, to, it's going to first destroy us. It's going to turn our religion, our theologies to an unrecognizable level if hate goes unchallenged within our faith tradition. And I, I was planning to say more, but I will, I will stop. Well, there. let me ask you a question because I, I mean, I'll bring something Jewish in in a little uh -huh. bit, but I'm, I'm just curious. What do we do with chosenness? And here I am speaking as you know, the Jew, who says we're the chosen people. <laughs> how, does, how does the concept of the election of whatever our faith tradition is as being God's chosen people, how does that play into hate and eradicating? You know, Rabbi, I had a, an interesting lunch with a rabbi, a friend of mine, who said there was a Which strain. Because we know we all know oh, each I'm sure, other. Yeah, just like all <laughs> black people know each other. Yeah. Um, he talked about a strain of Jewish theology that rejects chosenness. The reconstructionist movement. Yes, and I think that Chosenness is a dangerous concept. I don't know that you can walk your way theologically out of chosenness without leaving handles for hate. Mm -hmm. So the way that I read the Abrahamic covenant, and it is for you to tell me if I'm way off base, but within it is the seed of universalism. Mm -hmm. This is for you, but it is to bless the goyim. It is to bless the nations, right? So I think that this strain of universalism uh, is something for us to lift up and exalt in our theological traditions. And that whenever you find people in the business of narrowing and restricting, they are funding hate. Uh, to say there, there is Christian language, which I abhor, the lost. No one is lost. Uh, that is insider, outsider language. Or, uh, even the way that Christians talk about uh, doing mission, which Du Bois was clear that doing mission was not a religious project, it was an imperial project. It was a plundering of land project cloaked in religious garb. So chosenness is very dangerous. I think that because what we know of your tradition and mine began uh, amongst a small group of people, um, you see yourself at the center of the human divine exchange, right? Whoever is telling the story, they center themselves. But I think we need to be very clear of the interconnection. And, I, and, though, and even though uh, many of my theological professors would, would, would kick back at me, I, I think chosen is, is very dangerous. I, I am in no disagreement with you, Bill. Um, I believe Christian, Jewish, and Muslim chosenness is at the heart of hate, mm -hmm. Christian, Jewish, and Muslim hate. But I'm not willing or ready to give up on chosenness as a total category. Mm -hmm. uh, like most things, if it is tamed well, if it is disciplined through the ethical moral teachings of Judaism and Christianity, I think it's a beautiful concept. So chosen by who? For what? If we can qualify and tame the concept of chosenness, because it's innate. If you feel no particular pride about who you are, if being Muslim, Christian, and Jew is not a source of, uh, source of particular commitment. Um, why are we in that team to begin with? Like there must be some level of self-recognition and self-pride uh, accompanied with a sense of responsibility. I am chosen, this path is mine, given to me by a higher power, for what? Um, if, it is, if it could be channeled into a constructive, more, um, uh, more godly work, I see no element, because the danger is, if you, if you beat up, you're not doing that, but if you beat up chosenness too much and sort of push it to the margins of our theology, then you get into this very shallow relativism, that all paths go to the same place. I mean, there's nothing unique or special about being Muslim or Christian and Jew. It has a potential, that impact, to me a negative impact, in, uh, in eroding or watering down some of the 
accumulated unique wisdom that our traditions have developed over the years. Let's claim chosenness. Like, let's claim anything from the hands of all crazies, Jewish, Christian, Muslim, <laughs> and otherwise. Like, they don't own this business. Mm -hmm. And let's show what does the mainstream enlightened Christian, Jewish, and Muslim theology says about this chosenness. How can it be a source of good instead of a source of hate and violence? So I'll, I'll give an example going back to what you were talking about with your conversation with your rabbi friend. Um, that, uh, that strain of Judaism, that line of Judaism, Reconstructionist or Reconstructing Judaism, was born in the 1920s out of a desire to find a more universal way and a, more, uh, a way to reconstruct Jewish identity and Jewish ideas in America. And in the 1920s, you can understand why that was necessary after mass migration and, and, and Jews staying among themselves. Rabbi Mordechai Kaplan, who was a conservative rabbi, conservative Jewish rabbi, came up with this concept and it has grown ever since. It is not uh, among the, the largest groups of uh, Jewish denominations, but I think that much of what they have to say about chosenness and uh, spirituality and supernaturalism is in fact embraced by many, many Jews even though they don't know it. His point was that every people is chosen for some special aspect of who they are in their uniqueness. And so we can cling on to that idea, we can embrace that idea as much as we want, but if you think that it's about God saying that the Jews are better than everyone else because we are chosen, you are wrong. In fact, in a classic blessing where when we have the Torah scroll in front of us and we're reading it in the sanctuary for public worship, for public reading, um, we normally sing out, Asher Bachar Banu Mikol Ha'amim, who has chosen us from all other peoples. And the Reconstructionist movement has changed that liturgy to read, who has made us close to his will, as opposed to chosen us, because anyone can be close to his will. In fact, your rabbi friend, Daniel Hartman, I heard him speak about how when we have that, those words, not only at the Torah, but also when we hold up a glass of wine to celebrate Shabbat, that we should not be saying those words either, because if you really don't believe in chosenness, why would you say something that you don't believe in? <laughs> so it's a, and, and that's an Orthodox rabbi, very well respected, very universalistic, even in his orthodoxy right. and whatnot. There's a beautiful scene in the Holy Quran where God says, we suggest that this responsibility of the word, Quran, Torah, you can include all the revelations to mountains, to the seas. They all, I wanted to choose some other creatures, but they rejected. Mm -hmm. But the human beings were full enough to say, <laughs> yes, pick me up. So right. we are chosen, and that chosenness is not a source of superiority, but a deep sense of responsibility. And I appreciate the way you textured. I think that humanity is chosen. Yeah. And I appreciate the way that you said each with its own particular um, vocation. And I think um, when, when we consider that in seminary, they call it the scandal of particularity mm -hmm. in reading the Hebrew text. Why this people? And the way that the theologians d deal with it is to say that from the particular reality of these people, the universal can be accessed. Very much so, uh, Toni Morrison has a similar argument with her literature, when people would ask her, why don't you write about white people? Hmm. Well, she says, I can write about black people, and in their particularity is the universality of the human mm -hmm. experience, right. right? No one was asking white novelists, why don't you write about black people? So mm -hmm. the reality is our particularities are theaters for the universal if we can hold them together and not lift up some and subjugate others. Absolutely. So let me, let me add two pieces of text to the conversation. Um, just because you've, you've played into my hands, I, I have them <laughs> right here. You might remember at the very beginning of the book of Genesis, it says that um, God created Adam, humanity, mm -hmm. in God's image. Mm -hmm. And so the rabbis, around 2,000 years ago, asked the question, why was there only one Adam created? Like, why wasn't there a Jewish Adam, a Muslim Adam, and a Christian Adam? Why wasn't there a white Adam and a black Adam? And they, um, they are very clear in their utilitarian 
answer to why it is that there was only one atom. I'm going I'm to read it just so that we can have it really exact. They say, and this is from the Talmud, right? So it's about 1,500, 1,600 years old. For the sake of peace among people, that one might not say to his fellow, my father was greater than your father because, after all, my atom is more important than your atom. Or for the sake of the righteous and for the sake of the wicked, that the righteous might not say, ours is a righteous heredity, and that the wicked might not say, ours is an evil heredity. You can overcome your zip code. You can overcome your past based on how you live your life. And for the sake of the different families, that they might not quarrel with one another. After all, the rabbis say, Look at how messed up we are now, 2,000 years ago, with just one atom. Could you imagine if we had 15 different atoms, how bad the world would be? And remember, they were writing this in the Roman era, right? So there's this great sense in Jewish literature and Jewish wisdom that, yes, the, the, the universality that you mentioned in Abraham's blessing is preceded 12 chapters at the very beginning of Genesis, that's why the Torah begins with the creation of the world and not the creation of Israel, hmm. not the creation of Abraham as the, uh, as the first person for it. Hmm. Any thoughts on it? Well, I think very briefly, the, the Gospels do something similar. So the Gospel of Matthew locates the genealogy of Jesus in Abraham, the Gospel of Luke in Adam, in the first human being. And it's interesting, even in your reading, you did not gender I'm, I'm very careful. Not, let's also we'll just say something, yeah. just parenthetically. Yeah. We were very aware as we were planning this that we are very diverse in all different kinds of ways on the stage, aside from the Duke thing, because um, <laughs> I feel like I'm in a minority now going to SUNY <laughs> Albany, and, you know, <laughs> there's no competition there, right? Um, but there, we definitely. are very aware, we are very aware that we are all male, and we regret that, but circumstances do not allow us to go beyond. Not only regret that this person, I apologize for this. I usually never participate in all male panels. There was last minute cancellations that I refused, but given the sanctity and the importance of the topic, I just couldn't refuse. We should have had female colleagues joining us. It's a, it's a mistake that requires an apology. I Thank completely you. agree. As do I. You were saying though. No, I, I, I was done. I mean, I just, I thought it was the, the language, the universality language, oh, Adam yes. and humanity. Right, 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 right. And Pauli Murray does some interesting work with that, but yeah. So in, in part, the reason why I do that is because in my progressive liberal theology, I'm not sure that we're talking about a guy named Adam. Mm -hmm. We're talking about humanity, and, and that's a whole nother, I mean, we can spend the whole day <laughs> right on that one, but uh, right. let's not go there. Uh, I don't want to dwell too much. I think you beautifully summarized it. Um, imagine if there was more than one Adam, or if there was more than one Abraham. There is one Abraham, there is one covenant, and look at the fight within the dysfunctional Abrahamic family. I think this is cooked into the whole system yeah. of this multiplicity within oneness even. This is, this is the tradition, and as Quran says, I created it from a single male and female. Quran even genders, but puts men and women equally. Mm -hmm. But it was my decision to create you in different colors, tribes, but for a divine purpose that within this, you will, you will get to know one another, or in other words, you will compete in doing God's work. Uh, you, will, you will sort of compete each other, who will score better, who will contribute more on the face of earth. I think that mess is cooked, inevitable, but it's for a purpose, to see if we can take these unique identities, connect our common ancestors, but try to get to know one another and lift right. up one another. Exactly, and, and again, I'm gonna go back to another, another text from the Jewish tradition, another 15, 16, 1700 years ago, where Rabbi Akiva, one of our greats, said that the most important verse in the entire Torah is, this will come as no surprise, love your neighbor as yourself. Other people have said that that's the most important commandment as well, along with others. But then his colleague, Ben Azai, said the verse, this is the book of the descendants of Adam, him who God made in God's likeness, utters a principle even greater than love your neighbor as yourself. You must not say, since I have been humiliated, let my fellow man also be humiliated. Since I have been cursed, let my neighbor also be cursed. For as Rabbi Tanhuma pointed out, if you act thus, realize who it is that you are willing to have humiliated, a person whom God made in the divine likeness. 
So that just takes us back again to that sense of universality, even as we have our own ways of engaging in religion, in godliness, and spirituality. Curious, anyone want to bring anything to it? Yeah, please. Yeah, and it's funny that, uh, if you could mention your name. Uh, Jake. Jake. You know, people always are striving to figure out how to do that. One way that comes to mind that works for me is the language in Pauline writing about the spirit versus the letter. Understanding what, this is also Paul, the whole counsel. What, what is the thrust? And I think that all of our communities from the larger theological and denominational families to local congregations in local places place emphasis on different pieces of the tradition. And I think the, the, the best conversation is to be honest about where we place emphasis. And then to say, our reading of this tradition this is how, this is the, these are the lenses, or this is the lens through which we read this tradition. I think that gives you an honest encounter, because you're right, Christians place different emphases in the Jewish family and the Islamic family. And I think to be honest about that is the beginning of that conversation. It is the beginning of the conversation and also a long process. Um, how not to do what you are suggesting is, in my mind, this... Um, very modern attempt to sanitize religion, mm -hmm. sort of selectively go and, and look at the parts of the text, which I feel many of the liberal wings of Judaism, Christianity, Islam in the West has done, uh, in my humble uh, judgment, irresponsibly, uh, sort of engaging with the tradition, not accepting the whole tradition, not struggling with what's challenging and celebrating what's wonderful, but completely shying away from what's challenging, and even taking it out. Um, like whenever I engage with some of the liberal wings of Islam, Judaism, and Christianity, where there's so much emphasis on the, the, the God of love, the God of mercy, and it's all there. But the uh, God of uh, accountability, uh, God of uh, responsibility, anger, judgment, um, like the reaction is as if those don't exist, that's not part of our tradition. Mm -hmm. You can't do that. You can't do business, business of religion in that, in, that, in that sense. You can do many things, but ultimately I think you will do more harm than good. Our job, as you beautifully put it, is to just struggle with it, to understand, uh, understand and minimize its potential damage and toxicity, the kind of racism, hate, bigotry that it imposes or it pumps into the hearts and minds of the believer, but find out a way to challenge it, channel it into a more, which, which could be which absolutely could be with that level of, uh, if you just only focus on what's mushy and fluffy and then shy away from what's difficult, uh, I think it will be something else. It won't be the kind of traditional uh, thousands of years of historical grit, wisdom grit that we are connecting ourselves to with these traditions. As one who could be accused of the mushy and lovely mm -hmm. stuff because I'm a liberal, um, I will say that when we do deal with those components of it, that one of the keys is to understand it in its historical context and its theological context. And if you can do that, then you can get to, okay, that was for a moment, and that's even a challenge because we're talking about scripture, and some people won't say that it's for a moment, it's for eternity. eternity. Um, and then how do we apply that in our world today? Sure. Also, religion, if I may, um, it may be an external reality to many, but for those of us who are people of faith, even though we are discussing an external text, it is almost, or tradition, it is almost studying an MRI result. Mm -hmm. 
mm. even though you are looking and studying an external reality, it is showing what's within us, individually and collectively. When I see the tumors of Islam growing in some parts of the world, in some periods of Islamic history, it's a tumor within me. It's a mm. cancer that I need to work within all my tradition mm. and find out a way how other aspects of my tradition will cure that cancer. It's not an external reality. It's not somebody else's problem. I think we have to read and study religion, even the difficult parts of our religious communities that gives rise to some of the most troubling elements or strings in our tradition. It is us that good and evil within each and every one of us, each and every community. We cannot just quickly divorce it and disconnect ourselves from it. So maybe we'll move on to a, a, another realm of the conversation, which is so here we are talking about how is it that faith can be a part of eradicating hate. And we live in a world where lots of faithful people have been doing their faith on their own for the past two and a half years. <laughs> what is it about COVID that, um, and, and the realities that we live in today and everything that we're talking about during these days, what is it about all of that that gets in the way of religion being a way, of faith being a way to eradicate hate? A doctrine that is central to Christian thinking is the doctrine of the incarnation, that God has become one of us. And that community then is uh, flows from this divine human interaction. So the way that I teach this is I use the poetry of James Weldon Johnson, uh, his poem, The Creation, the way that he sets out the divine intent is these are his words in the poem. God said, I'm lonely, I'll make me a man. So what's beautiful about that is that we have a God who desires relationship. Uh, why would the divine create us if not a desire deep within the mystery of the divine being to be in communion with us? And so one of the challenges of COVID is that we have we are out of practice in some ways of being in community. And what I hope we will learn to do safely is to reimagine what community is, but then also, as the Imam has, has shared, understanding uh, the shadow and the light of community. So we're here, uh, a lot of the hate that is practiced is practiced in community, it is nurtured in community. So all of the gifts that our traditions bring, there is light and there is shadow which requires us to keep reading, to read deeply. And I would agree with what you said. I love your language about the cancers that we see grow inside of us, uh, that they are not external to us. So we as a community uh, locally and denominationally are trying to figure out what it means to re-engage because we don't think uh, that we can worship as fully as we are called to unless we can do so in some way in community. And I'm not diminishing virtual community, but there is something to be said about uh, human contact when we can share space. Is church back in the building? Yes, we are. So we're, we are hybrid. Uh, what we realize is we're making huge investments that if you don't continue to allow people to connect virtually, you will lose most of your people. So we're doing both things. And what percentage are back in the building? I would say 30%. Most, 30%. Yeah, most people are online. Wow. And most of our, our giving and connection comes from online. <laughs> wow. I, I, I totally agree, and I wholeheartedly believe that, I hope so at least, this whole virtual insanity is temporary, that we will never give up that human interaction, the realness. And at Duke, we tried every possible way. We were only closed for business for one semester. Mm -hmm. But thankfully, we are living in North Carolina. It's 10 months of a good weather. Uh, we prayed in the parking lots. We prayed in the quad. We, we find out a way to at least see each other, even if we cannot shake hands and hug. Uh, we try to be in person uh, as much as possible. I'll try to answer your question a little bit more broadly beyond the COVID. You said, what's getting in the way? Yeah. What's getting in the way, I think, in two categories. Why religions are not really delivering home runs on this front. I think there are a whole set of diagnostic problems. Um, religion and religious communities are, in my mind, humbly failing to diagnose religion as part of the problem when it comes to hate and bigotry. Mm. There is a understandable, but quite honestly, very difficult to forgive um, honesty, self-critical reflections. Uh, when does our religion become part of the problem and, and what causes it? Um, 
there in, I will give you examples from my own community. If I hear one more person saying Islam is a religion of peace, I will pull my hair and scream. <laughs> like what a silly statement at best for to call religion on anything. Like the Christianity is a religion of love. Really? Like can I study some Christian theology with you or Christian history with you? How can a religion can be essentially just one thing and it's only good? So there is, there is a lot of um, shying away, not taking enough responsibility, not enough moral courage to discuss the role of religion as part of the problem. We haven't diagnosed this as well. And our lack of ability to discuss this and honestly engage with it give a lot of uh, power to the extremes and the crazies and the mm -hmm. radicals, unfortunately, because the mainstream theology or mainstream community seemingly, they are distancing themselves from these uh, ugly elements, those tumors and cancers that I talked early. So there's some diagnostic problem first. Mm. We, there is some sort of a, in many places, especially in interfaith settings, um, divorce religion from any responsibility in producing hate. Mm. Uh, in the secular front, there is a, there's the other opposite. Uh, blaming religion for everything under the, uh, under mm -hmm. the, under the sun, mm -hmm. but I'm talking about faith communities. Right. And in terms of strategy, uh, if you diagnose it well, what kind of medicines, modern vaccines that we can develop? Because clearly, some of the forms of hate, especially stemming from religion, it, in its core, it's the same virus, but it's manifesting differently. There is some sort of a treatment problem that our inability to engage with our text, with our old tradition, much more creatively, boldly, much more faithfully, that we develop or improve some of the religious vaccines against hate seems to be missing, so that broad umbrella. So you, um, you put extremism as opposed to mainstream. It, do you think that there's a critique also to be had among liberals, not necessarily mainstream? That's, that, I put all of them in one umbrella. Uh, I always and publicly say one of the most difficult words I, I sort of having a hard time tolerating is, is moderate. Mm -hmm. Because those mainstream and, and liberals, are, they are all part of this silent, sleepy, weak, inactive, moderate camp. That um, I am very much anti-moderate. Uh, I, I have a hard time accepting how we can have the love of God and just be moderate and do nothing about it. Mm -hmm. and, and not be fired about it, not have the zeal in your heart to do something with that belief, with that connection, with that love and devotion to a higher being. Um, I think they are all part of the sleeping majority, moderate camp, um, which our religion should play a role in shaking their imagination and forcing into uh, moral courage and moral action. It sounds very prophetic of you, the, the I, role I, of the prophets I, of ancient Israel. I try, and you know. Horace knows how much hot waters I get, put myself in because of this work. You know, I would, I would say I agree with you on the, on the moderate front that those persons, their faith truly is in the maintenance of the status quo. Mm -hmm. and, and religion becomes uh, kind of, you know, so here is something I've been thinking about, the, the death of the queen and, and the funeral, which I watched. And <laughs> on display there was something very dangerous. And it's called by sociologists of religion and theologians, civil religion. Um, we have to begin by talking about the Constantinian capture of Christianity, where Constantine saw that he could use these symbols to further his imperial reach and power. Therefore, Christianity became bastardized and a faith. Now, Jesus was not a Christian. He lived and died as a faithful Jew, but a faith that finds its genesis in one who was exterminated, lynched, as James Cone reminds us, by an empire is then used by empires to solidify their power. So the queen's funeral, while I knew the liturgy by heart, Anne-Marie, because that's the liturgy we grew up with, I was nauseous by the marriage of the imperial symbols of the British Empire with one who was lynched and destroyed by empire. Mm -hmm. That shows us how far we can drift. And the text is right before us. The text is clear. John is clear that religious authorities like us, professional religious people, and political folk conspired and whipped up the crowd to get him lynched. And I think nothing could be further from the reality of the teachings and embodiment of the teachings of Jesus 
than the damn British Empire. Mm. I cannot agree more. We will be very good friends. <laughs> good. And there was another, I, I felt exactly the same. Uh, I got sick 15 minutes into British Museum in London when I visited. Boy. I threw up. I couldn't continue it because of what that museum represents proudly of all the stolen, looted, plundered uh, material from all over the world. It was very difficult to see that organ of that reality is a church, a religion, uh, and, and completely under part of that government and hand in hand. But also, uh, it's not only British. Let's not take some cheap shots at this. We are experiencing United Nations now in New York, and every autocrat from the Middle East are bringing their rabbis who are on their payroll and their priests and their imams displaying this incredible fluffy, mushy kumbaya business. Uh, that I think, fluffy, mushy again. Uh, yeah. I will give example from my own. Uh, um, President Erdogan, I'm Turkish originally, mm. president of my country, he's a, he's a, he's a I think, verified anti-Semite. And he pumped that anti-Semitism to Turkey, which has a historic, a much different relationship with the Jewish community. He brings all these rabbis and trying to present a whole different picture because he can, because the religious institutions are part of the government. They are a ministry mm -hmm. within that government. And what a bastardization. What a, what a destruction of religion of any kind when it becomes, um, when it becomes part of a governmental organ, for governmental, governmental structure. So let's bring it even closer to home. As we were getting to know each other, we began to talk about Christian nationalism. And Bill, you had some some strong comments about that. Yeah. Do you want to? Well, what I would say first? again, and I, I'm not taking a cheap shot uh, at the at the empire. You're exactly right. The United no one does civil religion better than the United States of America, and the white evangelical movement. I mean, you, you think about uh, Gardner Taylor has a masterful sermon where he he talks about. Billy Graham as as the high priest of American civil religion like that the ones who gain entree and access and how that power is leveraged for their own protection but then rhetorically they're on the payroll so I think about Amos you know we say Amos Amos the, the prophet and you know his his whole thing about you know to whom does this sanctuary belong does it belong mm -hmm. to God or does it belong to the king so when I think about Christian nationalism uh, I just think the modifier Christian should be dropped because it, it, it is steeped in a certain read, a certain iteration of Christianity. But I think that that kind of, in the words of Frederick Douglass, um, woman raping, human whipping Christianity cannot be seen as as Christian. It is it is it is a bastardization. It is it is. It is dangerous, and I think that this Christian language gives them cover. Hmm. One of the things that I wish the media would do is to call these things what they are. I think that the euphemisms give life. The euphemisms allow, so for example, uh, one of the things that I don't allow when people talk with me, I don't allow myself to be called a minority. I'm not a minority. In, in this, I'm a citizen of the world, and in the world, I'm not a minority. That language is used to leverage power in the United States. In the United States, I am minoritized, but not a minority. When you talk about uh, groups of people being underserved, no, underserved is a euphemism. These are people who have been exploited and oppressed by policy, by violence. So to call this Christian nationalism, it is white supremacy, that dances with the civil religion using the language and symbols of Christianity to press forward a certain political ordering and a certain means of distributing power and wealth. And I think we have to call it out. And most of the, and I've talked with people from New York Times, Washington Post, smaller outlets, they are afraid to speak in that way or their editors won't allow them to speak in that way. And I think that those of us who are in the in religious theological camps should lift up language differently and force a kind of historical and theological accountability. I totally agree. And the silver lining is that's what makes me love this country despite its all flaws. If Muslims in Turkey or Jews in Israel or other Christian communities in some other countries would have the kind of zeal, commitment, resources that white evangelical Christian nationals have, <laughs> they would have declared theocracy a long time ago. Mm -hmm. 
If there is one threat of theocracy creeping Sharia of any kind, it's the Christian nationalist white supremacist oh. Sharia. Oh. We should be afraid of. Oh. But despite their century and a half long um, incredible work, really, sometimes you, you, you can't help but admire that level of dedication. Look at this whole Roe versus Wade. Look at this 50 years of relentless work. Which moderate Muslim or Christian worked that way? Which moderate Jew, liberal Jew, they or won. bro, yeah, this is a 50 years of work. So despite this threat, which is very real, and no one does it better than us, uh, we are still somewhat a functioning democracy, if you can call it democracy. It is a fascinating reality, which I hope we will not lose. That's why I'm not going anywhere. Whoever comes as a president in 2024, the battle is not done yet. They didn't win it. Despite this incredible effort, some, some parts of system is still working and functioning, which we should strengthen and fight against. And on the issue of uh, white supremacy, so I, I feel obliged being here representing the entirety of the Jewish people, <laughs> right? Yeah. Um, I that do that all the time for 1.7 billion. <laughs> oh, yeah, you well, guys are in total, good. what, 14 million? Yeah, something it's like a, that. It's a neighborhood in Karachi. You're doing okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> my, um, my concern is that um, Jews, we, generally Ashkenazi, Eastern European Jews, pass. We look like white folks. And at times, and, and I don't mean to be offensive in any way, but at times we are too white for the black community, and at times we're too black for the white community. Yeah. And the reason why we're having this conversation here in Pittsburgh is because we were too black for the white community in one person's eyes at that day. It's not just one person, he's a whole movement, right? He represents a whole movement. Mm -hmm. But that's a real challenge that we have, and it's one of the reasons why I walk around with this, mm -hmm. right? I mean, I have a lot of reasons for them. I, li I like the idea of Jewish peoplehood. I like the idea of humility before God. I like the idea of tradition. And I like the idea of people knowing that I'm not just possibly one of them, mm. as it were. You, you're making a choice, right? But it's interesting. I know, and I, I have that choice. Yeah. And I know that you don't have that. Oh no, choice. no, no! But I want to. But I want to thank you for making it. I, I was Six and I Historic Synagogue in Washington. It's a fascinating story. Um, the church I pastored prior to the one I'm pastoring now used to own that property. So in the Northeast, you know, quite a few synagogues became Black Baptist churches, Black Methodist churches when Black people moved in and people left, but. One night, I, I was invited there to preach, and I, the first thing I said, and I said it three times, no niggers, no Jews, no dogs. Mm -hmm. No niggers, no Jews, no dogs. I mean, if you put that into your search engine, you will find signs galore throughout the United States where that's what it was. And I think the, the challenge is the provisional, and notice, the provisional acceptance of Jewish people into whiteness is provisional, right? right? And, and you have to just be very clear about what that means and what you sacrifice. But one of the things about whiteness, and of course there's a whole new this scholarly neighborhood of whiteness studies, whiteness does what is in whiteness's interest. So the bringing of Jews into whiteness, which is really, according to some scholars, part of what happened post-World War II, mm -hmm. is to open that door of whiteness to Jews. You always have to wonder, because one read of history to, to, with which I agree, is when Pauli Murray and Thurgood Marshall and Charles Hamilton Houston were fighting, uh, they were not fighting for integration. They began fighting for shared resources across the spectrum, but Whiteness then takes that fight and says, let's do integration because ultimately what this will do is weaken their hand economically and politically, and that's exactly what happens. So you have to be very careful when Ronald Reagan signs into law a king holiday. Now you better be damn suspicious mm. of that, right? And, and the Juneteenth, the offering of crumbs symbolically instead of reordering society fundamentally and redistribution, which we, you cannot have the eradication of hate without the redistribution of power and resources. So if we're just standing with, this is a big kumbaya festival, which I abhor, which makes me vomit, if that's all we're going to do. Redistribution of power, redistribution of resources. I refuse a lot of these King Day speeches and breakfasts sponsored by Bank of America and Wells Fargo because you have absolutely nothing to do with the tradition of Martin King. And so what are we really doing here? And I, and I think that the challenge that you are providing to me and 
because it's to me, to the entire Jewish community, is um, how is it that we can take that provisional entry into whiteness and use it for the good of humanity at large? How can we be that prophetic voice that has rung true to say, it's not how it's supposed to be. We need to be changing that. And also, that unholy trinity you mentioned, know this and know that. Just because some of you, some of the people are accepted to whiteness, that didn't go anywhere. That train hasn't left the station at That's all. Right. And it just finds a different language. It just finds a different, different narrative. Or it just times it out. It, it sort of says, I will visit you guys later. I think yep. Charlottesville and the recent... Right. Recent anti-Semitism, rise of anti-Semitism shows us yep. that even that whiteness is, is not enough. Uh, but the real danger is in the language. Nobody outwardly say what you just listed, three people. But they are saying it different ways that we have to be incredibly vigilant. After eight years of President Obama eating bacon, drinking wine, and going to church, 29% of Americans believe he was a secret Muslim. Like one third. It's your fault. You didn't baptize the guy <laughs> properly. So one third of the Americans, in some states, if you take the t national 29% to certain states and certain churches, certain parties, it's 80%, 90%. They believe after eight years of this public life, he was a secret Muslim. But if you really listen to those who say he was a secret Muslim, if you pay attention to what they are saying and what they are doing, they want to say he's black and that's why we hate him. But they can't say it, and therefore they say he's Muslim. Mm. So they will use a different language, just different narrative, different smoke screens, saying the old, or same old. I think the genius of evil to make you believe that that doesn't exist anymore, that change, that's gone. It didn't go anywhere. It's, I'm, it's still alive. I'm still laughing about the bacon wine in church. <laughs> I, it's funny. I, I thought the bacon was going to be something about being Jewish. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't know where it was going to go. Um, so let's, let's do this. We've got, we have about five minutes to go. Let's, let's see, anyone else want to be a part of the conversation? And then we have an obligation to say, what are we going to do about this? Yeah. But we have to do that all in five minutes. Yes. I can answer very briefly. Yes, I do. I write about it. Uh, if you know, I've, I've said a whole lot of stuff about it. Radio, television, all outlets across the nation, and some internationally. The majority of people who are pastors, priests, rabbis, imams are afraid. Hmm. They are afraid to shatter through the myth and the euphemism, and will not do it. And they come in all colors, shapes, sizes, and across the theological perspective. This is why your, your language about moderates, um, you know, King had something brilliant to say about the moderates. He blamed them more so than the, the muscular, conservative, mm -hmm. white supremacists, because the moderates just sit and watch. And we are afraid. We are on, in different ways, the payroll of the queen and the king and unwilling to speak. That's my answer. So it's what's, what's really wonderful about this is as we were planning what our to-do steps would be, that was your to-do step, yes. to call out Christian nationalism. I'm curious, uh, I, I feel like it's not my place to do it mm. as a Jew, as a rabbi. Mm. And in fact, uh, 13 miles east of here in Monroeville, Pennsylvania, where my wife is the rabbi of the synagogue, in the ministerium, the gathering of clergy in the town, the Christian pastors said to Barbara, you sit out this one, we're going to write the letter. Mm. Right? And they said, we have the responsibility to call it out. Mm. And so I feel like I know that I have to, but I feel like I would be doing a disservice to 
not the mushy, but the interfaith that I'm trying to build, the bridge building that I'm trying to do. I totally agree that we need to team up. Mm -hmm. But dropping the title Christian or Muslim would be easy. Um, and it wouldn't even do the job. No. At some point in Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, we put a kosher, halal, Christian seal on slavery. Mm -hmm. We baptize this business. We make money out of this. Uh, one of the most profound memo memoirs I read was a Muslim African who was enslaved by Muslims, sold by Muslims to a group of Presbyterians <laughs> um, who chained them on the deck of a ship singing hymns while they were whipping them. Wow. Like this is, we are all in this business. Some part of our religion got corrupted yeah. uh, in this. And, and we need to figuratively drop Christian by unbaptizing uh, certain parts of our mm -hmm. theology, certain parts of our uh, religion. That's the real work we need to do. Otherwise, dropping labels will only do cosmetic and it's not gonna change anything. It's the, it's the beginning. Nothing changes without a language shift. So it's the beginning, but it has to be, again, if this does not lead to a redistribution of power and wealth, hate continues to sink its tentacles more deeply into the soil. And what was your name, ma'am, in the back, your question? Allison, I want, I want to share this. This shows my own complicity and continued growth. So I'm in Washington. I get a call from the Speaker of the House, uh, and they want me to offer the opening prayer. Uh, for um, one of the sessions uh, of, of, of the House of Representatives, which you know is entirely perfunctory, and they get priests and rabbis and imams to go in and talk about how great America is, right? So what I did is they make you write the prayer, and I wrote a prayer and submitted it, and they emailed me and said, you cannot pray this here. <laughs> then can you revise it? I sent another one, and they sent it back. I said, I, it is not possible for Bill Lamar to pray a prayer that Democrats and Republicans will accept. This shows you my own compliance. What I should have done was sent them what they wanted and prayed the uh -huh. prayer that, that was inside of me. That's right. Which is what I normally do, but I capitulated. Until we stop capitulating. Now, if they ever ask me again, mm -hmm. right? So, so th those are the pieces. They won't. Yeah, they, you're right. They know better. <laughs> but, but I did not assert myself. I was obedient and tame. And we got to stop doing that. Let's, uh, let's, I, I let's that, do this. I did that prayer twice, and I also capitulated. But even that wasn't enough. No one asked me. They, <laughs> no, they, they know you. They, the they fired. They tried to fire certain uh, members of the House of Representatives. They tried to fire the House chaplain because they, he allowed me to use a very generic language of maybe we should be more ethical and moral. Well, wow. let's do this. We are just about at time. But I know, Abdullah, you're doing some very important work with imams. Can you describe that? Not only imams. What I invite myself to do, how can I put my money where my mouth uh, is, um, I think I know of no trick other than education to solve hate and bigotry. There is an education of learning and unlearning that I first have to take on within my own community. Where does hate appears within the Muslim community? What is Muslim hate towards Jews, Christians, Westerners, and others? And in what way certain creative unlearning opportunities, unlearning educational strategies uh, can heal my community from reservoirs of hate? And how can, it make, how can it make my community a little bit more resilient? One strategy I'm doing, particularly in the Jewish Muslim spaces, my community has a lot of learning to do, unlearning to do. We learn many things that is making us vulnerable towards uh, anti-Semitism. So I am creating different alternative, in my modest capacity, leadership pipelines, where some, of, some members of my community, with no obligation to like anything that they hear, with no obligation to agree any of the political uh, solutions or conclusions, they are committing themselves to try to see the world through the eyes of the Jews, through the eyes of the people who they disagree. Is there a way in which, beyond political debates, beyond kumbaya fluffy dialogue <laughs> where everybody wants to just schmooze and say good things about each other, is there a way in which I can try to make sense of, and one of my greatest inspiration is Mandela. Uh, you should really read his article about making sense of your enemy, making sense of people that you disagree, with no obligation to like them. But can you make a genuine attempt 
try to understand this worldview. I know many, many activists who converted white supremacists by engaging with them. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not putting uh, the people that I engage to that category. Right. But there is a way in which, in addition to all the wonderful strategies out there, for some of the most contentious, most complicated matters, can some of us step back and try to learn the, the side that we are opposing? And that seems to be educational at least working incredibly. I will give one example. There's a program that uh, Ron is referring to, a group of Muslim leaders joining and committing a one-year fellowship to understand what Judaism, Zionism, Israel, Israeli-Palestinian conflict mean to Jews in the world. Again, with no, no obligation to agree anything. <clears throat> Can I see the world through the eyes of this broad spectrum of the Jewish community? One of the greatest victories, I remember, like one participant after six months into the program, we are just learning. This is a one-way educational learning. She said to me, I hate you, Abdullah. I just hate you. I said, what happened? Until this program, I was telling to myself that I'm not an anti-Semite. But I'm an anti-Israeli, anti-Zionist as a pro-Palestinian activist, which most Muslims are, proudly so. But once I see the world, what these terms mean to so many different Jews, so many different Jewish communities, I realize I am doing to so many Jews what's been done to me. People are defining my Islam. People are disrespecting my right to self-define myself, self-articulate myself. I am creating categories that many Jews, for themselves, they don't create those categories. And I'm just hiding my subtle anti-Semitism behind these flashy uh, or flashy words. So I am inviting others. Like, is there a way in which some of the success is depending on our individual and collective ability to unlearn what we have learned already. That is enabling hate. That is nurturing hate within our communities. Can we put emphasis and, uh, and resources into unlearning, unlearning in order to make our souls more fertile in receiving love and eliminating hate? This is one of many strategies. And maybe with either of these strategies or many more within the faith community, we can in fact eradicate hate. Inshallah. Thank you, Jim. God willing. Thank you. Thank you.